Hello, my name is Dr. Ariel Sloan, and I'm an addiction psychiatry fellow at the Yale School of Medicine. Let's start with a few questions. Have you ever heard that race is the reason for health inequities between racial and ethnic groups? Have you ever heard that systemic racism is the cause of health inequities between racial and ethnic groups? I want to make it clear that it is systemic racism, not race, that drives health inequities. In this lesson, you will explore how systemic racism impacts addiction treatment along with some practical strategies. At the end of the video, you will be able to define systemic racism, understand U.S. drug policy as an example of systemic racism impacting patients of color with substance use disorders, be able to implement the structural vulnerability assessment tool in the clinical encounter. You have probably heard the term systemic racism a lot in the news recently, or in your schools and workplaces. When we talk about systemic racism, we want to focus on the systems and the structures, not necessarily the individuals. The purpose isn't to make anyone feel bad about themselves. The purpose is to understand how we, in our role as healthcare providers, can work to more fully understand the lives of our patients and develop treatment plans that address the ways in which systemic racism negatively impacts the health of our patients. In the United States, systemic racism is a way of thinking about the residual effects of our history of removing Native Americans from their land, enslaving people of African descent, and segregating people based on their skin color. Although these are forms of explicit racism that have now ended, there continues to be inequity between racial groups in the United States. According to Dr. Kamara Phyllis-Jones of the Morehouse School of Medicine, racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which we call race, that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities and unfairly advantages other individuals and communities and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Systemic racism is a form of discrimination that is not centered in one identifiable bad actor. Rather, this is a form of discrimination that is baked into our institutions through laws, policies, and institutional structures. So how does systemic racism factor into substance use treatment? Racial and ethnic minorities use alcohol and other drugs at similar or lower rates than when compared to non-Hispanic whites. But systemic racism is strongly reflected in the legislation pertaining to substance use in the United States. People of color have and continue to face heavier consequences for substance use within the criminal justice system and less access to newly developed treatments. For example, in the 1980s, the war on drugs levied harsher penalties on people of color for substance use. There was no difference in the rate of cocaine use between communities of color and white communities, but there were differences in the type of cocaine used. Crack cocaine was more common in black communities, whereas powder cocaine was favored in white communities. In 1986, a law was passed that required the same mandatory minimum sentencing of five years for only five grams of crack cocaine as compared to 500 grams of powder cocaine. That is a 100 to 1 discrepancy in the mandated minimum sentencing for different formulations of cocaine. This led to a disproportionate number of black and brown people being sentenced to longer periods of incarceration. Today, the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. One in five incarcerated people are imprisoned for drug offenses, and a disproportionate number of imprisoned persons are people of color. This is because laws unfairly target black and brown people who use drugs compared to white people who use drugs. Now let us consider the U.S. policy response to the current opiate epidemic an epidemic of substance use perceived as affecting mostly white suburban communities. The two main drugs to treat opiate use disorder, methadone and buprenorphine, have similar pharmacology. Both occupy the opiate receptors in the central nervous system and reduce the use of heroin and other opioids. Methadone has been around longer and is available only through specialized licensed clinics located mainly in marginalized communities that require patients at least initially, to present to the clinic each day for treatment. The passage of Data 2000 allowed certified physicians to prescribe buprenorphine in private doctor offices.
This should translate into greater access to medications to treat opiate use disorder for everyone. However, shortages of public sector buprenorphine prescribers and the higher cost of buprenorphine have severely limited the availability of buprenorphine in black communities. A recent high profile study showed white Americans were three to four times more likely to receive buprenorphine treatment for their opiate use disorder than black Americans despite disproportionately increased rates of opiate-involved overdose deaths among Black and Hispanic Americans. You might be wondering, how does this apply to the patient in front of me? Is this problem too big to tackle in a clinical setting? Being a healthcare provider with structural competence will allow you to address systemic racism in your clinical encounters and make a big difference in the overall quality that your patients receive. Structural competency is the ability of healthcare professionals to recognize and respond to larger socioeconomic, cultural, and political contexts, including systemic racism, during patient visits with self reflective humility and community engagement. We recommend that all our trainees become familiar with the Structural Vulnerability Assessment Tool. This tool will help you understand structural vulnerabilities and intentionally address domains of your patients' lives that are impacted by systemic racism. Let's take a look at the domains of the Structural Vulnerability Assessment Tool. These include discrimination, financial security, residence, risk environments, food security, social network, legal status, and education. You can find a link to a full assessment tool in the resources. Let's explore the domain of food security with a clinical example. During a substance use evaluation, the provider asks patient X the recommended questions. Do you have adequate nutrition and access to healthy food? What do you eat on most days? Do you have cooking facilities where you live? Patient X shares that she often runs out of food by the end of the month. The provider then asks about food stamps and patient X tells you she is unable to receive SNAP benefits because of a prior felony conviction. In 1996, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act banned people with felony drug convictions from receiving SNAP benefits, a program funded by the federal government. Theoretically, this policy would impact people of all races at the same rate. But it's important to note that people of color are more often targets of police surveillance and that when charged are more likely to be convicted of the crime. This is an example of how systemic racism in the United States drug policy affects the health outcomes of people who use substances. Patient X, who is black, goes hungry at the end of the month and is unable to access public resources to buy healthy foods. To comprehensively treat patients who use substances and have substance use disorders, it is imperative that we understand the effects of systemic racism because systemic racism drives health inequities for marginalized racial and ethnic groups. Asking about structural vulnerabilities offers an opportunity to intervene in the lives of our patients, take actionable steps towards mitigating the effects of systemic racism, and work to achieve equitable health outcomes for people who use substances.